And the third place will be is the source of the All right, everybody, it is 2 p.m. I'm going to ask Peter Hugo to come up and introduce our special guest this afternoon. Peter? It's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce uh, our National Federation of High Schools um, sports swimming diving uh, editor, um, Sandy Searcy. She is without a doubt one of our, if not, you know, biggest supporters of high school swimming and high school coaching. So Sandy's going to come and talk a little bit about some of the things you may want to hear, and then she'll open it up and maybe if there's anything that you'd like to ask her, she'd be she'd welcome in, um, any uh, feedback at all for anything. Sandy. <laughs> Not know. Who's got the second mic? Who's got the second mic? I did. I'm going to walk around. It's fine. It's fine. Good after test. Test, test. <laughs> if you want people to hear you. Okay. I, I do need instruction. I'm doing this by feel. Good? No. How's that? Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for that very nice, kind invitation and introduction. Um, these two gentlemen over here, um, Don and, and Pete, uh, actually met with me about for about an hour before um, coming up here today, um, basically educating me and, and letting me know uh, the things that have been discussed the last couple of days and so that I can prepare some remarks that would um, be interesting to you and um, be informational. So let's, uh, let's start out with um, the National Federation rules writing process, just briefly. I know um, last year I talked about that, probably the year before, and probably the year before that, but I just wanted to make sure everybody understands that um, our, our, the way we write rules and what we think about when we write rules. Um, our committees, our sport committees are made up of 11. 11 folks uh, up until this year, and I'll explain that in a second. But we've got a chairperson, we've got an, somebody representing the officials association for the National Federation, somebody re representing the coaches association for the Federation, and then the next eight individuals represent each one of the eight sections. So imagine the country split up in, into eight sections. Some sections have five states, some have eight, some have, I think there's one that actually has nine. And it covers all the states in the country, um, including Alaska and Hawaii, obviously. We have 51 state associations, however, and DC is that extra state association. So um, putting it into perspective as far as swimming and diving, we have 47 states participating in swimming. There are those other four states, um, we have one not participating in swimming. We have a, a couple of others that may have swimming in the state, and then yet another state, Tennessee, that has their coaches association run their state championships. So they're not considered in one of, as one of those 51 uh, state associations involved in swimming and diving. We just look at those states that sponsor swimming and swimming. So 47 states sponsor swimming, 35 states sponsor swimming and diving. So if you're not confused now, um, let me tell you about some of the variables that we have to um, work with when we're considering um, swimming and diving across the country. 
So obviously, if you think about it, we're, we're working with uh, states that conduct their state championships and their regular seasons in outdoor pools. Hawaii, uh, California, Florida, Arizona. Um, there are probably a few on the East Coast as well, but um, depending on when their seasons are. Oh, yes, and the seasons. Some conduct their boys and girls seasons at the same time. Some seasons are separate. And oh, by the way, we have seasons going in the fall, winter, and spring. So uh, if you want to talk about state championship formats, we're all over the board there too. Um, we have uh, time finals. We have um, situations in certain states that uh, a swimmer and or a diver can qualify during the regular season based on a cut. We have prelims and finals on the same day, prelims and finals on the different days, boys and girls state championships together, boys and girls state championships separate. At the same time, different sites. Um, we have a couple of our states that conduct team swimming championships in addition to individual swimming championships. So we are truly all over the map. We have very elite teams, high, high level teams all across the country that swim at universities and colleges. We have um, state championships held at high schools. And think about the skill level. We have everything from seventh and eighth graders swimming high school diving up all the way up until uh, up, all the way up until uh, seniors and and all levels of participation um, we've got lots of uh, juniors and seniors that will be participating in the olympic trials and we've got a ton of them that are just learning as they enter high school as a freshman so threading that needle when we're talking about uh, rules writing it is a really tough thing and and usually um, when we first meet together, as far as the rules committee meeting, um, we, we talk about the different landscapes and the different paradigms and trying to come up with some, uh, a set of rules that everybody can follow. It's tougher than you think. Um, when we meet, um, we, we have met uh, virtually prior to the, the meeting um, in that uh, we, we provide some education for our committee members. Um, specifically, we conduct uh, during, the, during the season, during the mid, well, we call them mid-season uh, webinars, mid-season meetings. We have four of those every year, and in, uh, usually in the fall, a couple in the winter and one in the spring, just before the, the uh, rules committee meeting. And the reason we conduct those is it gives the state administrators an opportunity to problem solve um, things that they, issues they might be experiencing across the country but we also invite our rule committee members um, to sit and, and listen and ask questions and become educated, hopefully, on what's, what's happening across the country. Um, then we conduct a, a meeting before the meeting and we talk to the new committee members uh, about the expectations, um, some logistics, some housekeeping type things, but hopefully we prepare them adequately to come into that um, hotel, wherever it may be, and be ready to uh, have some good discussion on the proposals at hand. Um, our meetings are half a day, one day uh, the, for the first day, a full day the second day, and a half day the third day. And um, typically we, we talk about philosophical things that first night, talk about issues, general issues, and, and um, policies and philosophies. A lot of times during our discussion topics, we uh, look at uh, grouping some of those proposals together because a lot of times you get multiple proposals about the same thing but different twists on those proposals. So the committee tends to try to break that down so that when it comes to the next day when we're actually um, uh, considering the rules and, and voting on those that they have a good understanding of what the concepts are, the pros and the cons and that kind of thing. So that's the first day and the second day, at the beginning of the second day, we have some staff members come in and give some reports not only on education, but also on injury surveillance. And um, so, sometimes we have some technology presentations. It just depends what, what staff members are available. And in the afternoon, the second day, we start on the proposals. And typically that lasts for the, uh, eh, probably it can last the entire rest of the day. Um, this time we got done in a couple of hours. Um, and uh, then the committee starts to work on its on developing the educational resources um, about uh, having to do with the rule changes. And that could be anything from the exams, the situations, the PowerPoint, um, rules interpretations, situations, the whole shebang. 
So that process, as far as the resources, that continues for the next two months. Um, so as we get the rule book um, edited with the first round of changes, we send it back out to the committee. We ask them to proof it. So everything has multiple sets of eyes on it. Um, when there are errors discovered after the book is printed, that's a bad day for me because my name's on that book. So um, we, our, our committees have, have always been pretty diligent in trying to make sure that there are no mistakes because one wrong word makes a difference a lot of times. Words matter. On versus or can make a huge difference in, in any sport, but particularly in swimming and diving worlds. So we take that part seriously. Um, so that's, that's kind of how we, um, uh, how, how we go about the process. Um, there are other things that we do over the course of the, of the year. I know that we've talked about um, questionnaires in the past. We've talked about general surveys so that is different. Those are different from the questionnaires. Um, we're, we're a data committed uh, uh, committee, and we try to make decisions based on data, based on research, based on the results of experiments. Um, we don't um, uh, consider or uh, pass rules in a vacuum. We understand that there are no other rules codes in this country, and we try to um, educate ourselves as far as what's working. Um, if our rules are different, what's working with the other rules code? Does it fit well in high school world, or does, is it not for us? Um, and, and I'm referencing NCAA, USA Swimming, World Aquatics. So when we put together the list of proposals, I visit with uh, representatives, leaders in each one of those organizations to um, get their take on um, the rule proposals before us so that we can get a little bit of pro and con and consider what the other rules codes are doing with the understanding, and again, we hit this hard on that first day, we are high school, we are education-based athletics, and we are going to um, pass rules um, based on high school athletics. And it's great that other rule codes may be doing something a little bit different. It's wonderful when we can be consistent but we are a different entity. That doesn't mean anybody else is doing it wrong or is, or is wrong. It's just we are a different um, age group and we have a different philosophy and mission and vision. And so we, have, we keep that in mind in everything that we do. Uh, one of the most important things that we consider is risk minimization. And one of the, one of the first things we talked about um, earlier today, you, want, you would like to hear about what's happening with the backstroke ledge, I think. Um, and as a matter of fact, um, that will be a point of emphasis in this coming rules book. Um, you're not the only ones asking the question. Uh, last year, um, we approached the NFHS Foundation for some funding for research having to do with the backstroke ledge and six feet of water depth. And that was due to a proposal that was submitted by this group um, and, and Diane Hicks-Hughes um, to the committee last year. So uh, the NFHS had already committed funding to a number of other projects. So we thought, well, we'll wait till next year and propose again, um, because we wanted to have, th have that research in our back pocket to make sure that we could justify permitting back backstrokers. And particularly, if you think about it, those young freshmen, six foot tall, gangly, young men who are learning to use the backstroke ledge, unfortunately, the first time at a state championship. And we wanted to make sure that uh, six feet of water was an appropriate depth for that, that one situation that might cause harm to someone. So um, at the summer meeting, uh, we have an annual summer meeting in a latter part of June and July. Uh, we conducted our rule interpretation meeting for swimming and diving, and there was somebody in the audience who happened to be the chair of, who happened and still happens to be the chair of our swimming, and, uh, sorry, of our water polo rules committee. And uh, she works for the CIF Southern section. CIF has 10 separate sections in their state, their federation, much like the national federation. Um, and the individual, the commissioner, the leader of the Southern section was uh, getting ready to retire. They had some extra funding from the pandemic, and they were willing to, don't, to dedicate that money um, to Greencastle High School for that research. So because it, uh, the monies came in a little bit later than we originally thought, um, it pushed back the research until after the trials are, are, uh, take place here in June. 
And that uh, the research will start, they'll be conducted, uh, it will be conducted at the natatorium. Um, we, we all know each other in this space. And so Ed Merkling um, is going to offer the natatorium free of charge to those researchers so that they can bring kids in and uh, test, test the water depth. Um, it's a pretty intricate system, um, but the, the individuals at Greencastle and there's another uh, uh, researcher at Michigan State, they were the ones that created the first or established this, this, not only the software, but the infrastructure um, for that first ledge study at four foot of water depth in 2015. I think it was finally published in 2017, but that the result of that research really precluded us from permitting the backstroke ledge at that time, because it showed that there were some outliers that would have hit the bottom had, had it been at four feet of depth. So when you do the research, you bring in kids who have never used the, the, um, the apparatus before, um, you don't give them any instruction. You create the worst possible scenario that somebody might experience um, using it for the first time. And, and that, that's what was tested. And that's what showed that there, there was a risk at four feet of water depth. I think I shared with this group um, two years ago in, in talking to some of the manufacturers of the ledges, one of them said to me, well, maybe that backstroke ledge is just not meant for high school because of our four feet. I see Rarely, but occasionally with my kids that are learning. Um, where that, the ledge would make them a little more stable. And that's why I'm in favor of it, because I have far more injuries like that sure. than I would with the bottom. Sure. Thank you. Welcome. Um, I, I certainly can bring it to their attention. They're limited with the 20,000 that, that they have with they have to work with. But I, I can certainly mention it to them. Anybody else? OK. <clears throat> Um, so there are a fair number of pools that don't have a six foot uh, starting end, um, but have four, four and a half, five. Um, so those schools are high schools are not going to be allowed to use the ledge. Not until some additional funding for additional research is is put together is is established. So how do we deal with records and things like that with a ledge, without a ledge? <laughs> um, we're, we're not going to. There, there's not going to be an asterisk. Um, there, there's... Well, I would hope not, but I'm just asking the question. Sure, yeah. sure. <laughs> so that, that's a great question. Do you know if the study will also look at how much of an advantage they, they will get. Because I know that my kids at swim club really aren't faster during their club season. They're just a little more stable because that ledge is so narrow. I would imagine the answer to that is yes. Because it, it, when they did this research um, in 2015, 16, whenever it was, they looked at velocity, they looked at depth um, the, and angle of entry. Um, I do know that they're also looking at the concept of a swimmer being able to adjust based on where he or she is in the water. Um, there has been some research done for forward starts that um, we're not talking about scoop dives, but swimmers can alter their path mid-air if, if, if they sense that they're going to go too deep, they can alter their path. So there's going to be a little bit of um, uh, research done in that area, but um, the advantage uh, will definitely be tracked. So the previous research showed four feet was not safe. Correct. But it didn't, and I'm assuming it was done in a, a deep pool, it didn't indicate what depth was safe. It didn't, it didn't look at would five or six feet have been safe? No, we did it at four feet at that time. Visualize a cage underwater of um, fiberglass with very uh, piping to, to um, I'm, I'm not a researcher, to uh, frame this, the area where the swimmer is going to enter the water and um, underwater cameras and uh, lots of, uh, lots of uh, computations 
So we were just looking at four feet at that point. I think, I actually think there was a proposal on the table at that time for four feet. And so we wanted to, I, that was the first year that I was coming out of the state office and into the Federation, knowing that this was going to be a question. And so we commissioned it only on the four foot at that time. So will this research just specifically look at six or will it say, let's say six is not, will it look to say, what is a safe okay. depth? Um, so it, it's a scattergram. So there are points all over where, where the entry point is, how deep they went, how fast they were going. Um, but the points of entry, the deepest point, imagine a bunch of little dots all over um, the area. And so that's, that's what was presented by the researchers to us. There were a few that were below the four, four foot line. So theoretically, if all of the entries, entry points were above five feet, that, you know, that would be part of the research findings. So it is quite possible that, you know, if, if, if five feet, if there are no um, outliers uh, beyond five feet, uh, we would consider that as a committee as well. Will the study be available for review, you know, peer, you know outside to look at? Afterwards? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, the last one was published. Okay. Um, by the Councilman Center, and uh, this one will be, I believe, authored by Greencastle University, DePaul. Sorry, DePaul. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, the, the idea is they're they're going to be publishing it, so Fantastic. it will be available. Anybody wants to Google that? I mean, I I think it was uh, I, I could certainly get you the results of that because I it was in a, a bunch of journals in 2016, I, 16, 15, somewhere in there. Anybody else on that one? All righty. So the next thing um, we, we probably need to talk about is the questionnaire. Pete and, and Don were, uh, we were all three of us uh, discussing idiosyncrasies with the NFHS questionnaire. And up until just recently, uh, we were releasing the questionnaire to the state associations who had the um, job of determining who in their state would receive, who of their officials and coaches would receive the questionnaire um, in order to provide um, their responses that would go back to the National Federation. And then each state administrator had um, the opportunity to submit a response. Um, this uh, Just after the swimming and diving questionnaire was released, um, we did a little experiment with the next three sports and offered that questionnaire to all of those individuals who were in any way, um, in, in any way had a relationship with the NFHS. So in other words, if they took an NFHS course, a learn course, if uh, they had logged into NFHS for any reason, um, we, it's, it's a fairly sizable database of about a million folks. We have officials, we have coaches, we have parents, we have athletes. And um, that questionnaire was sent out to um, coaches and um, or athlete or sorry coaches and officials, and the results from those showed a 200% increase of, of what had been received the year before. The concept um, in providing that questionnaire to the general masses versus to leaving it to the executive directors is that the, a lot of times the executive directors want to control who that questionnaire goes to. Rather than, uh, so, there, some have philosophies that rather than sending them to every uh, official and coach in the state, they want, uh, they have a, a, an advisory committee of officials or, or coaches and they send uh, uh, the, the questionnaire to them um, wanting their response and then they uh, get that back and send it to us. Um, with the idea that uh, a lot, not everybody is informed about rural proposals or about what's happening in the state, and they don't want any responses to skew the state's collective response. So we've got a couple of different philosophies out there. Um, up until this experiment, we we allowed or we 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 sent the questionnaires and allowed the executive directors to choose who would receive it. 
And so I'm not sure what's going to happen with this with uh, the questionnaire process at this point. But I do not know the I do know the experiment took place, and it was a great response. And I wish swimming had been a part of that experience. But um, stay tuned on that. Um, we may be uh, sending it out to the masses. And uh, in our world, more data is better. But we have to wait to see how the executive directors re um, react to that and how our leadership team reacts to that. But that's kind of something that's out there. Um, we'll let you know that uh, the committee spent a quite a bit of time talking about general survey questions. This is not the questionnaire. This is something that is distributed to state associations about every two to three years. And it asks questions not so much about NFHS swimming and diving rules, but about policies and philosophies and procedures having to do with how do you train your official? How do you conduct your state championship? How do you, um, how do you qualify kids for your state championship? And everything in between, and you, it's quite lengthy and it's usually about 50 questions. And so the committee talked about some things, uh, taking some th antiquated things off of that general survey that was conducted in 2022 and adding some new questions. Uh, actually, Don just came up with one that I can, can ask questions about actual facilities, um, diving boards, and, and we certainly can extend that to um, starting blocks and how many lanes and that kind of thing. But uh, state associations typically go to that survey when they're, when they're contemplating changing their formatting or changing how they train their officials or you know looking at what the best way to do a b and c so that will be coming out to state associations those administrators are responsible for filling it out we pretty we we don't take no for an answer we try to get responses from everybody it takes a little while but um with their schedules that you know it's it's pretty tough to sit down for an hour and do this but it, it's used for multiple years and it's really beneficial. So that is coming down the pike. I say this to you, if you have any questions, anything in your head that you think uh, might be helpful as far as rule proposals or helping your state when you're contemplating this, that, or the other, please get them to me. Um, Pete and Don know how to get to me. Actually, I, probably most people in this, in this room have my email or my cell phone. So. Please send them to me uh, after we get done with the rules book, which is in a few short weeks. Weeks we'll start um, putting together questions for that general survey, and it is a monster. So it takes a little bit of time. So that if you have something that's burning out there, um, please feel free to send it to me, and I'll get it on there. Because again, we're not going to do this for another two years. So um, just wanted to let you know about that. Uh, you said, um, Pete, you wrote down talking about rationale, and I think that is uh, relates to the survey and maybe the questionnaire that NISCA might think about um, providing for its membership. You have a huge population of coaches out there. It's a it's a, a great resource, and we were talking about ideas of maybe conducting a Zoom meeting. Um, those the questions on on a questionnaire doesn't necessarily have to match the questions on our questionnaire. Um, we are membership driven, meaning um, questions for the questionnaire are submitted by coaches. I'm sorry, for the NFHS questionnaire, they're submitted by states and the committee. So we don't have the benefit of all the coaches. You might come up with, you, you, you all the ones in the trenches. So I, I think it'd be an excellent idea for you to come up with your own questionnaire or survey and, and ask some of those, not only the technical questions, but some of the philosophy questions and, and protocol and, you know, it's endless as far as what, what things you could come up with, I think. Um, did I say, did I articulate that correctly, Pete? Yeah. Okay. We also talked about uh, Pete uh, running or putting together a Zoom meeting. I'd be happy to be on it and, and facilitate that or, just be a fly in the wall. Um, all data is good. And if we have an opportunity where people can submit ideas or talk about what they think needs to be done, um, it's, all, it's all good. It's all good. And I'd ha be happy to help fil facilitate that. So um, I should stop right there just for a minute. What Are there any questions I haven't hit yet? OK, I'll keep going. So general items that we talked about that uh, we did not 
pass any uh, legislation or rules on. Um, the committee had several long discussions on technology and the problems associated with the wearing of watches, what can be done, what can't be done. Um, we know that there are several situations in the rule book that are not congruent with our rules. And uh, we tried like heck to come up with something, um, some, kind, some language that would solve all the problems. Um, we all know that technology, um, I'm saying it in this room, but, uh, and I know it's going elsewhere, but technology um, is not policeable sometimes, hardly ever. And so any kind of um, legislation or language that we put together, we understand it's, it's placing a burden on the, on the officials and on the coaches and on the athletes. So uh, while there was lots of discussion, um, the language of the rule did not change, but there are several situations that will be adjusted based on the current language. And um, I think there's a good chance that one or two of them may go away because they're just confusing. Um, I will tell you that states have the ability to determine that watches are not permitted. That's not the NFHS rule, but states do have the ability to uh, deviate from that um, without being in jeopardy of losing their seat on the NFHS Swimming and Diving Committee. So the rule is basically you can make a rule as a state, it's called state modification, that is more stringent than what our rule book says and not, and not be out of compliance. And I think there are a couple of states here who have done that, uh, that have done that, their states aren't persons, um, that have done that, New York being one of them, be, um, and probably more of you that uh, your state's uh, leadership has decided to not permit watches because of the, uh, the nature of uh, determining, you know, if it's being used to, to transmit data uh, used for performance enhancing. So I just want to make sure that you you know as, as coaches that states can prohibit the wearing of watches. Uh, you know that swimming and diving made the jewelry prohibition go away many, many years ago that created a, some issues as, as far as figuring out what they're wearing, what the kids are wearing and, and how they're using it. But um, that's, that's our reality right now. Who has questions about that? Basically, devices, anything that's worn by a swimmer that collects data is okay. Okay? It cannot, no message, no signal can be transmitted to the swimmer during competition. Um, is that something you can communicate to the state associations? That, that plainly? Um, it will be a point of emphasis. It, but the way it's, it's written, I know that I had a conversation with um, our state association and they read the rule to me verbatim and said, that means no collect data collection. They said, no, it says it's allowed, but you're not allowed to transmit. And they said, no, you're reading it wrong. But, and I'm, so so you that's why it, I said that, that simple statement you made. Right. Good. But your state may have chosen to make that interpretation of the rule. And I would be okay with that. Yeah. But what they told me was, no, we're going with the National Federation rule and it doesn't allow it. Because I, I was a little confused where they were going. Because normally they say, like watches, not allowed. Got I, it? No problem. I really like the language we proposed. And actually, Rod Garman and I wrote that. You know, Good. it took a little bit from uh, World Aquatics, a little bit from the NCAA. Um, we didn't get over the hump. We'll try again because it was very clear what you can and cannot do and what we're talking about. What's in there now was really from when uh, we had tripods and video recorders on the deck. That's the language that's there now. And so I, I understand um, we all need clarity. I'm trying. <laughs> I did get it done this time, but um, we'll try to make the situations more clear so that in the interim, um, y'all could make better interpretations based on the language that's written. So, but, but do know, states can choose. To, that we had, uh, up until a couple of years ago, I believe Florida still prohibited jewelry. There were a couple states that may still prohibit jewelry, and you can do that. You're, it's more, it's more um, stringent than what the rule allows. So states may choose to 
um, do that, go in that direction. By your comment that it's going to be a point of emphasis, it means you're bringing it into the light to be a little bit more clear, correct? Absolutely. I would throw it, but I'm afraid I don't know how much it costs. <laughs> When we got to that question in Texas, um, our big concern was there are so many devices that are multifunction. How can you determine what functionality mode that device is in? Bingo. And, that, and that is why we were concerned on our end about it being allowed. So, The language in one of those situations that states if a device is capable of transmitting information um, means that it cannot be worn, we don't have rule support for that. Right. So that is the main piece that is going to be changed. Now, what states determine to yeah. do with that right. and what their comfort levels, are, levels are, and, and again, it puts the officials, doesn't seem to be an issue at the other levels of the you know, other rule codes, but we're high school, <laughs> you know, we're different. And, and we're very um, concrete, sequential, uh, tangible, we want tangible evidence. And in this situation, you're not gonna be able to tell. And so a, a lot of the co other codes deal with it. If they see an athlete receiving some kind of signal, that's when they go to the athlete. A, an official truly is not being asked to go to every single athlete wearing a watch asking if it's a smart watch. You know, and, and that's happened some places. So we, we don't want that to happen. Good point. And Grace, was, it was her first year on the committee. She was fantastic. Really, really good. Yeah, really, really good. Yeah. What else? OK. I think, I think Pete gave me something else to yeah, talk about. Another thing, maybe the differences between, uh, the, you, you know, how do we feel about USA rules compared to our rules? There oh. aren't very many changes to them differences but so the committee talked um, quite a bit about the differences between uh, starting protocols uh, there was a proposal most of you probably saw it about uh, mandating the whistle protocol and there's merit to getting everybody on the same page but we are a federation by design meaning state associations choose to follow our rules or not now if they don't choose not to follow a plain rule which means that would change the course of, an, of a contest. It would change the outcome. It's usually something pretty major. That would preclude a state from serving on the Rules Committee, which is a big deal in, in, in state associations' worlds. Um, so they try, if at all possible, to um, not go in that direction. But to mandate whistle protocols across the country, there were still some states that felt uncomfortable about not being able to use the verbal protocol protocol and I, I i understand if we are an education based rule code there is going to be some kind of teaching on deck for that brand new swimmer has no idea how to do a start and so the official needs to have the ability to uh, talk to the athlete and so I, I know that um, the other rule codes give um, some guidance uh, as far as small verbal phrases and, and things of that nature. But I, I think in general, uh, the states bristle at, at being told to take the educational component out of anything, the developmental component out of it. And so we, we left um, the protocol as is, so it's flexible. So it can be um, whistle or verbal. But in the course of our discussions, it became obvious that what we have in the appendix for both is antiquated language. So we're going to update the appendix so it, it has the update language for both of those. So that's the good news. Um, but as far as USA um, versus um, NFHS, it really, there are two rule codes now, World Aquatics and NFHS. And when NCAA and USA went in the direction of adopting, just simply adopting the technical rules of world aquatics, that's what we're left with. So we all knew that there was going to be added pressure to conform. When it makes sense, I don't think anybody has a problem with 
aligning with the, we call, we call it national trends. If you see in the rationale, it talks about aligning with national trends. We can't say it's because everybody else is doing it. That, that's not, I mean, that's not in our world. That's not acceptable. For example, the take your marks. You'll probably see that when it comes out, but that, that was an editorial change. But it didn't make sense not to. And it, it seems like it was, from what I was told at, from the technical secretary of World Aquatics, it's, it's more grammatically correct. So as soon as he said that, I go, okay, okay. We're not just doing it because everybody else is doing it. That makes sense. Um, we have made efforts, as you saw with the rule changes last year, to change some small components of our rules to align when it made sense. Some of those smaller things like stacking and, and um, yeah, you, there, there were like five or six of them last year. We, we felt like it's a good thing to bring everything in line, all the rules pertaining to the strokes. But we will look at everything individually. To be honest, we're not going to blanketly say, OK, World Aquatics is, is prescribing this. Um, let, let's go ahead and do it. I mean, there, there is a lot of vigilance paid to, um, does it work for the developmental swimmer, swimmer as well as the elite swimmer, and everything in between. So is that kind of what you want me to hit? Yeah, I, I have to have a question now. Um, I think Jay was telling us that um, the only is there's the three bodies, only two of them agree to no uh, to watches and no watches. Isn't the the isn't the NCAA and and World Aquatics don't they differ in that one? Because it's not a yes, because it's not a technical swimming rule. Okay, so World uh, Aqua doesn't care about that then. Uh, well, they they don't they actually develop a list of what devices are permitted based on what competition. And uh, the committee, maybe you didn't get that, sorry. But the committee had, had access to it. Um, it was a list of five or six uh, pieces of equipment. So they operate differently than the NCA, than the NFHS. But when we're talking technical rules of the sport right. and the strokes, um, it, when it makes sense to align, we're going we're gonna to do that. Now, the one thing outstanding is the backstroke. I don't know that we're ever, we will ever align there. Um, it would take a massive uh, movement on our on our part. I, I see nodding nodding of head, and if it comes if there comes a time that we need to change and go down the other road, I hope coaches will tell us. But there, there are no plans to move in that direction. So there there will always be that difference. We hope that, we hope World Aquatics will come over to our way of thinking. They have in a couple of situations. Um, we are really fortunate uh, with uh, NFHS to have the benefit of Jay Thomas, who is the Technical sec Secretary of World Aquatics. He started out as the USA um, Swimming Rules and Regs Chair, which is where I got to know him. Um, he kind of took over for Pat Lunsford as far as our kids initiative, the group that brings all the rule codes together once a year. And we talk about the differences and where we can align and what we can do to help one another. But um, he has since moved on to, by the way, he was a high school NCAA and a USA swimming official. Doesn't do high school any longer, but now he's up to the uh, uh, secretary, technical secretary of World Aquatics. The great thing um, about that is there are times since sw uh, NFHS swimming and diving meet first that he will let us know if there's something in the hopper as far as a potential rule change. And he will work, he has worked with us on language, which has then been adopted at the NCA level and then at the World Aquatics level. And he always likes to say, well, so NFHS was first. Well, that was with a little help from Jay. And he's, he's been so loyal. He's, he's just a proponent of the sport. You know? And he sits through our rules committee and, and guides us. He was really helpful um, with, with one particular um, issue having to do with uh, the manufacturer's starting points with um, the alleges, I'm sorry, the RJPs, my, yeah, my mind's spinning, the RGPs, RJPs, and I was not aware, um, the question didn't come to me directly, but it was a New York issue. I was not aware at the time that Omega had a starting point of negative 0.03. And apparently that information is, is not readily available or is not well known amongst our NFHS brethren. Um, we, he, he 
gave us that information. I gave it to Pete. Um, and the particular situation, the parent was, was talking about um, some disqualification that shouldn't have been called um, because it was point, negative 0.01. And he, was, he, had, he didn't understand the difference between manufacturers and assumed that we were talking about Omega and the starting point, the manufacturer's starting point. The relay was disqualified, rightly so, because it wasn't an Omega system. Yeah, so, the, the Colorado and Dactronics and so on, I'm not sure about IST. You don't do them. You don't, okay, so uh, Dactronics and, and Colorado build it into their software that, that the negative, uh, so they start at zero because they already have that negative one, two, and three built in. And, and of course, when uh, this parent read the, the rule, it says, uh, you know, standard margin of error. And they think, well, why didn't you guys do that? M minus one, oh, one is within the standard error. But it doesn't say Omega, doesn't say Colorado. It's a little ambiguous as to how that rule is. And I was saying that maybe we could put something like that in, but I don't know if that's possible. But it certainly could alleviate some problems when, when people don't know different manufacturing um, codes. I, th I think we could veil that maybe in a point of emphasis or uh, a situation somewhere down the road and say it's, it's up to the officials, the meet referee, or the timing system operator to know what the manufacturer's starting point is. That's kind of, that won't mean anything to anybody unless they know what, what we're talking about. And it's not the NFHS's uh, position to talk about what a, another manufacturer does. So I, I don't know that we can actually say, oh, Omega has a starting point of 0.03. I don't know how to get that done, but we're, we're, we're mulling that over. Um, we have to be very careful with manufacturers and what we don't say about them. Uh, you probably heard from Grace the issue in Texas was the positive outcome um, where a relay was DQ'd that had like a positive I'm sorry, point two, but it, since it was outside the, rec the guided thresholds of you know, negative 0.09 mm -hmm. to positive 0.09, the relay was DQ'd mm -hmm. because it was dual confirmation of two officials, even though there was a positive touch with the touchpad system. Um, is there going to be any further guidance available for officials, um, other protocols available for them to follow, or other suggested guidelines? that they may follow that are different than what's in the rule book currently? What kind of flexibility, like a state from Texas, that they choose to not go with that yep. particular current situation? Is that something that would push them out of being able to attend, be a participant? No, it wouldn't because that's an appendix. Okay. So that would that's be a appendix. state modification. But understand that that range, negative 0.09 to zero to positive, positive. 0.09, is, is theoretically an, a span of time that is not visible to the naked eye. That's why you take the official's decisions out. You know, it has to go with the system. But what happened in Texas is uh, an exchange was plus 0 0.10, which means you can and theoretically should use dual confirmation of the official's eyes. And in that situation, both officials had it, they disqualified. So plus 0 0.10. So again, negative 0 0.09 to positive 0 0.09 is not visible to the naked eye. So that's why you use the machine. Other, the, the outsides of the, that range, a plus 0 0.10, which is just what, a hundredth of a second more? Technically, theoretically, the official should be able to see that dual confirmation applies, that really was out. So we're not going to adjust the appendix in that way. Um, we probably can provide some more guidance. Um, Jay Thomas was the first one we went to. Jay, help! And and he said, you know, the 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 numbers are right. You know, that's that is those are the specs that we adhere to. So um, we did have conversation during the committee meeting that uh, uh, that went in the direction of how other states use that policy, that appendix. 
Um, I know that the chair said in Kansas, they use the RJPs to um, save an athlete, not disqualify. So I think states are using RJPs in all sorts of different ways. Okay. So uh, I, Grace was clear that a modification would not put them in jeopardy, and I don't want to lose Grace. I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> so good, good question. What else? I don't even, 2.52, I've been talking for 50 minutes. Holy cow. Come on, you guys have some questions, I'm sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you you're welcome. Um, Pete, is there anything else? I don't. I don't. No, wanna... we're good. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> Three days of talking. I feel like I missed something. No, I think it's good. Oh. Yeah, take that microphone off. Then we'll talk to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>